Okay. Hello there. Um, we'll get back on the photography videos here right after this, but I want to show you something that you have never seen before. I predicted this would happen um, almost a year ago, and uh, the discovery is a copyright by me that I actually confirmed the same. 12-20-2014. On the right we have a uh, N50 Gauss neodymium iron boron, one inch by one inch by one inch, and over here inside uh, a double layer of uh, black cloth and the only reason it's in there like that is to prevent thermal reflectivity actually using forward-looking infrared you can actually can get a reflection back and get a false reading um, from the FLIR but I will show you what's in here and then I will show you what's so exciting in just a second now there's no such thing as free energy but there's two ways to actually harvest natural energy and of course there's no free tap in the universe for harvesting free energy. Well there is, there's plenty of free energy out there but not free energy as in generating something from nothing. Um, the Soviets and the United States in the past uh, experimented with uh, low level alpha and beta radiation to use in submarines as a heating device, not directly, but indirectly. It would actually heat the devices and there would be heat dissipation coils and vanes to actually heat up, uh, you know, extremely cold uh, deep water submarines. They actually experimented with that. It, it proved to be a, a bit too hazardous. Um, I hear it's actually still used in uh, some covert methodologies. Uh, related to submarines and some other devices. Uh, there also uh, is a heating device. Uh, there are a little nuclear, uh, there are thermal, thermal radiation uh, heaters that are actually uh, used on a, a few satellites that use uh, radioactive decay to cause heating. But uh, unlike where we have uh, helium nuclei, we actually have radiative emissions. What we can do is take the field coherency as present in a magnet because a magnet denotatively is nothing other than field coherency. There's no uh, quantitative difference in this neodymium iron boron before it is magnetized or after it is magnetized. There's only a qualitative difference of field coherency. The same thing with coherent light versus incoherent light. Like a 5 watt light bulb is totally worthless. You can't even read by it. But a 5 watt laser, i.e. coherent light, will burn a hole right in your ass. And I've been collecting lasers for 20 years. So let me get to the point. What in this boring little display here should excite you that I discovered and that I predicted? Okay, let's take a look at the forward-looking infrared. I actually outlined the neodymium iron boron right here by the square. We have the ambient air temperature of 64.2 degrees. And here's the bismuth sphere on the left. Okay. And now, after 10 minutes of exposure, let's see what happens. We have a change of, it averages about 9, 9.5 degrees. Now, is this enough to heat anything by? No, certainly not. But we actually have heat production with no input. And how does this occur? Why does it occur? It necessarily must be so by understanding what is diamagnetism. What is extremely low magnetic permeability? Actually, there's no such thing as superconductivity. I mean, I actually grew up using superconductivity, quote-unquote, sets my entire life. I've even still got Dewar flasks in my basement. I grew up playing with liquid nitrogen. What you conventionally call superconductivity is actually nothing other than bringing the yttrium barium copper oxide ceramic disc to the temperature of liquid nitrogen and hovering a magnet over top of it. And uh, people call that superconductivity. It's not what you're doing is you're causing super diamagnetism i.e. incredibly low magnetic permeability magnetism for lack of a better word without getting deeply into what magnetism is of course Faraday referred to magnetism as a dielectric field as the loss of inertia through centrifugal and centripetal reciprocations reciprocating precessional hyperbola that defines magnetism but there is a heating of, I cast this myself, by the way, from molten bismuth. This is 99.99% pure bismuth. I cast it myself. I've even got the casting device over here if you want to see it. There's oh so much fun messing with the dangerous liquid bismuth. Um, splatters on you, then you've got some real issues. Um, thankfully, it melts uh, at a fairly low temperature. 
Um, the wonderful thing about bismuth too is when you heat it, it actually shrinks, unlike most things, and that has to do with the dielectric nature of bismuth. Now, bismuth, like lead, does not naturally occur in the earth. Le all lead is depleted uranium. Lead is actually a rare element, but we know lead is everywhere. But it's all depleted uranium. Bismuth is actually uh, more so rare. All bismuth does not naturally occur. It is an insanely rare element. How bismuth actually uh, comes to be about in such abundance in Earth's crust is it has depleted Neptunium. Now, the Department of Energy actually released, I think back in 1986, that uh, bismuth uh, is... Uh, excuse me, that uh, Neptunium is fissionable, just like Uranium is for making atomic bombs. But anyway, this is the universe's most heavy, stable element. It's heavier than lead. It is incredibly stable. It has a half-life of something uh, like two and a half times the age of uh, the universe, something like uh, seven or eight billion years. Um, actually, the only reason that it even registers as radioactivity at, at all is that it has uh, super minute amounts of polonium in it. Polonium is uh, toxic, lethal, dangerous. It's right above bismuth. The point being is that we have heat production in the bismuth sphere because the magnetic reciprocation, centrifugal and centripetal, are being impeded by the universe's most diamagnetic element. And what does diamagnetic... Remember, this is ambient air temperature, and here's the bismuth sphere. Okay, and here's the bismuth sphere here. We have a heating of 9 degrees in the bismuth sphere. Now, that's not free energy. What I'm doing, no difference in radiation, because magnetism is radiation. Not radiation, the true denotation, but radiation necessarily out of the statement of the fact of what magnetism is, which is the loss of inertia, which reciprocates centrifugal and centrifugal. You can actually see this using a Gauss meter, not see it, but you can actually measure the centrifugal uh, divergent reciprocations in the centripetal high gauss uh, reading on uh, the center of either side of the magnet. So we have heating in the bismuth sphere. I predicted it must be there and that's why I went to the trouble of buying a circular a spherical mold for the casting of bismuth. Now here we have our cube magnet. We have centrifugal divergent reciprocation from one side and centripetal return to the other. Same thing from the other side, centrifugal. Uh, centrifugal divergence and centripetal convergence. Same thing here. Let's just draw this out really quick. Okay, this is how it occurs. Actually, intermediate pressures will actually reciprocate to right there. You can actually see this using the ferrocell. You can actually see all of this too on uh, using just a Gauss meter. Now, what happens when you stick like a plastic ball or we know what's going to happen with a steel ball if you stick it here. Nothing's going to happen. You stick something you know, steel, plastic, glass, whatever, nothing's going to happen. Actually, very little does happen, uh, but it's not worth mentioning. But what happens when you stick the universe's most diamagnetic element, i.e. bismuth, right in the center face of either side of a magnet? doesn't matter what the polarity is. By the way, polarity is a misnomer. Polarity is just simply the inverse of counter space right here, the dielectric inertial plane. What we have is atomic excitation because bismuth is the most, what again? Lowest magnetic permeability, LMP. Lowest magnetic permeability element in the entire universe. And what that causes is unlike, remember there's no such thing as magnetic uh, attraction or repulsion, what it is dielectric voidance and countervoidance. Here we have two examples of two. Uh, equal polarity uh, magnets facing each other. The only thing you end up here, these will never stay together like this. I mean, you, I mean, unless you screw them together with a vise, what you have is force in motion. If you're actually able to have the strength to bring these very close. By the way, you see I have a magnet tattooed in my hand, right? Uh, <laughs> if you're actually able to bring these that close, you held one, you let go of the other, we go shooting across the room like a bullet. So you have translational force in motion vectors due to dielectric counter voidance. What you incorrectly and throughout all of history have called magnetic repulsion is dielectric countervoidance, which translates into force and motion. Now, if you were to reverse this, something totally different would happen. You have dielectric voidance. And instead of this pattern, what you can actually see this underneath the ferrocell. You have you have a decreasing sphere. As these come closer together, they will accelerate. Remember, increasing acceleration is decreasing motion. Now, that seems counterintuitive until you're actually thinking about it. Force in motion 
is the application of the loss of inertia increasing acceleration is decreasing force and motion. So as acceleration increases, force and motion decreases. We have increasing acceleration. Whenever there's increasing acceleration, we have decreasing motion. That's counterintuitive to what, you know, a typical human, all of us, all us human idiots think. We think of acceleration. Well, you're increasing your motion. You're stepping on the gas pedal. You're heading down faster the road. You're accelerating, therefore you have increasing motion. But that's not the case. That's actually the expenditure, the loss of inertia. You're actually expending fuel, i.e. gas, through the release by applying on uh, the accelerator sh uh, the acceleration pedal of your car. So we always think of acceleration as increasing motion. But in terms of field mechanics, increasing acceleration is always decreasing motion. Motion is always related to the release of force. Acceleration, we know that there's nothing. You take an apple, you hold it out in front of you, you let go of it, it's going to accelerate towards the ground, right? There's obviously no force involved right? You hold something out in the sky, you let it go, it will accelerate towards the earth. Meteorites accelerating towards the earth's surface. All of those accelerations, there's no force involved. So, what is diamagnetism? Well, we still think we're advanced critters because we have computers and cell phones and everything else, but as far as field theory, humans are really, really, really very, very primitive. I mean, if uh, some sort of advanced race were to drop by and take a look at us humans are like well they're certainly far from cavemen but they're still insanely stupid they really don't know the mechanics of the universe anyway by placing this bismuth sphere which has the you know it's the most diamagnetic element in the universe what we cause is atomic excitation of the bismuth by placing it and blocking the magnetic centrifugal and centripetal divergences convergences on one end or one pole of the magnet as you can see here in the forward looking infrared you see this heating of the business sphere here's a measurement of the same thing right off the business sphere roughly an average of nine degrees depends on what the ambient temperature is like right now it's hot in the house um, You've never seen this before. This may not excite you. I'll get back to the videos on uh, photography here in just a few seconds, but I wanted to actually show this to you. Now, this is not free energy. Mother Nature doesn't dish out uh, free lunches, so I am uh, be the last person to ever use the word free energy. But I mean, free energy. There's two connotations of free energy. There's free energy such as building the Hoover Dam and tapping an endless resource of uh, hydrodynamic power. We can say, well that's free energy, all we have to do is put the dam there. This is that same sort of free energy, but not free energy in the sense of creating something out of nothing. Now remember, these magnets will actually retain their Gauss rating for 50-60 years. Now, when we're talking about 9 degrees elevation and the temperature of this bismuth sphere, that's certainly not enough to heat your food or to do anything substantial, but I'm actually getting free heat excitation by using the universe's most diamagnetic element and placing it in front of a convergent centrifugal and centripetal field that is unable to properly reciprocate. Obviously we're not getting force in motion if this were two magnets. If these were two magnets, I mean, I'd have to have uh, He-Man arms just to get them together and if I were to let go of one, it'll actually shoot across the room like a bullet. But that's not going to occur here, obviously so. What does happen? We have atomic excitation because bismuth is the universe's most diamagnetic element, i.e. the lowest magnetic permeability. What means lowest magnetic permeability? It means it's magnetophobic. Magnetophobic. It will not allow magnetic permeability to occur. What necessarily must occur, since there's not force in motion applied, is atomic excitation. It's nothing fantastical. Nobody's thought of this before. Nobody thought to look for it before, but I did and you're the first person first people to see this discovered it last year but this is the first video of it and i will catch you later if you like this video drop me a buck or two and the photography videos will resume immediately but i thought you'd like to see that okay okay this is copyright ken wheeler 2014